Voices for Victory podcast. I'm your host, Heather Burns. Join us today is Suleika Jawad, an Emmy Award-winning journalist and celebrated TED speaker. Suleika is the author of the instant New York Times bestselling memoir, Between Two Kingdoms, which recounts her odyssey of healing and self-discovery after a diagnosis of leukemia at the age of 22 and given only a 35% chance of survival. Suleika is now cancer-free and is our featured speaker for our wine celebration in Napa Valley at the President's and Vintner Grant Honorary Luncheon. Suleika, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Hi, Heather. I'm so happy to be here. It's so nice to meet you in person. I've, I watched your TED Talk and I've seen some of your videos um, from, your, from the New York Times and, and just really great to talk to you in person, really inspired by you. Oh, and I'm so looking forward to the V Foundation event. So yes, and I will be there too. Well, I'll come say hi. <laughs> Obviously, your background is journalism. And uh, I'd love to hear how you got started in journalism. And was this your childhood dream? Is it something you always wanted to do? So, you know, I think like a lot of young people who enjoy writing. Um, it was my passion, but it wasn't necessarily something that I immediately thought of as a career. I felt pressure to do something more practical. And while I was really interested in becoming a journalist, specifically a foreign correspondent, figuring out how to get my foot into uh, the door of that world seemed daunting. So my first job out of college was actually working as a paralegal at a law firm in Paris. And in my free time, I was writing and reaching out to editors and trying to figure out how to get my start. And within a couple of months, I actually got what I thought might be my first small break, which was an opportunity to interview to be uh, a stringer in the revolution that had just started in Tunisia, which is where I'm originally from. But before I was able to pursue that, my life was interrupted. And almost exactly a year after my college graduation, I received a diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. And, you know, I think at 22, like a lot of young people, I had the sense of time time to figure out who I was, time to find a vocation that I hoped, you know, would feed me and nourish me and also pay the bills. And in that moment, I was confronted with my mortality. And it was this sense of cleaving. There was my life before the diagnosis and everything that came after. And in that first year of treatment, I had a really challenging time. I spent about eight months combined inpatient in the hospital. I called myself bubble girl because I wasn't allowed to leave my room. And I was watching, you know, my peers starting their first jobs, traveling the world, going on dates and all the other big and small milestones of early adulthood. Um, and I felt profoundly stuck. The idea of being a foreign correspondent felt completely foreclosed to me. I didn't know what I could possibly do from the confines of a hospital bed. And so I began a writing practice that was just for me. Um, and it took place in the privacy of a journal. And I wrote in that journal every single day. And something interesting began to happen in the course of writing those pages. I started jotting down observations of the medical world that I found, suddenly found myself living in. And I recorded, you know, overheard conversations by the nurses station. I wrote about the fellow patients I was meeting. I wrote about the things that felt impossible to talk about with my loved ones, um, the infertility caused by chemo, the fear of dying before my life had really begun, um, the social awkwardness of being young and sick. And in a strange way, while I never imagined myself writing in the first person, I began to find my voice. 
And like the good millennial that I am, I decided to start a blog. Uh, and that's where I put a lot of that writing that I originally did in the journal. And I took it really seriously. Nurses would come in, you know, to check on me and I'd say, I'm on deadline. Uh, and of course, these deadlines were entirely self-imposed, but it felt important to have a job to do uh, beyond just being a patient. And to my great surprise, a few weeks after launching that blog, I received an email from an editor at the New York Times asking me to contribute an essay. And we got on the phone and I took a very deep breath and I said, I'm not interested in writing an essay. Uh, and then I took another deep breath and I said, but I'm actually interested in doing is writing a weekly column about the experience of cancer and young adulthood. And it felt important to me to tell that story from the trenches rather than from the perspective of someone who'd survived. Uh, when you don't know how your story is going to end, it really casts a different perspective on the whole experience of illness. And to my great excitement, this editor agreed and said we could do it for a couple of weeks and see how it went. And that's the strange thing about being faced with a life-threatening diagnosis like leukemia. There was a way in which cancer made me brazen because for the first time in my life, I realized I didn't have endless time. Um, and especially, you know, given that I was preparing for a bone marrow transplant, I wanted to feel like I had given more than I'd taken. I wanted to tell this story and to say it in my own words, on my own terms. And that was my first byline, my first time ever being published. That's great. That's amazing. So you were you were staying with your parents when you were in the hospital at that time. So what was what was that like after, you know, going through college and having your that independence and then coming home again and and you know being cared for by your parents? Mm. You know, I think one of the hardest things for anyone going through cancer treatment is ceding control. You cede control to your doctors, to the ever-changing timelines of treatments, to the side effects. And that was certainly true for me. It felt especially frustrating being a recent college graduate and wanting more than anything to feel like an independent adult in the real world. Um, and pretty much overnight when I got that diagnosis, I moved back into my childhood bedroom with its embarrassing pink walls and posters of boy bands taped um, everywhere. And I had this real sense of regression. I was as vulnerable and helpless as I'd felt, uh, you know, since the time I was a child. But I also grew keenly aware of what a privilege it is to have family around you in the midst of illness. And, you know, it doesn't matter how educated you are, having a caregiver who can sit by your side when you're too sick to advocate for yourself, I believe is one of the most crucial aspects of getting through an experience like this. And so what began as a sense of frustration and even anger uh, at having to be back home um, quickly transformed into a deep sense of gratitude, especially as I got to know other patients who weren't fortunate to have caregivers or family around them. Yeah, absolutely. And I know just going through six, this experience has changed your life so much. So after you went through um, the treatment process and, and um, you were cancer free, uh, what made you decide to start traveling and, and um, going on your journey? Mm. So, you know, we focus a lot on finding a cure for cancer. And that was certainly my hope for myself that I would eventually be declared cancer-free. 
And once I got there after nearly four years of treatment, what I wasn't prepared for is that the hard work of healing doesn't end with cancer treatment. In some ways, especially on a personal level, that hard work had just begun. The challenges of survivorship, of reckoning with the physical and psychological imprints of illness, of reckoning with questions of who I was in the aftermath of this experience and figuring out what I wanted to do next uh, were incredibly challenging. And I felt guilty because uh, out of the 10 young cancer comrades I befriended during the time that I was sick, only three of us were still alive at that point. And I felt this immense sense of pressure to live a meaningful life, to live a good life. After all, what was the point of having gone through all of these treatments if it wasn't to do exactly that? But unlike when I was you know, in the cancer bubble, I didn't have a cavalry of people around me. I didn't have discharge instructions or protocols in terms of how to navigate uh, life beyond cancer. And so I decided to create my own rite of passage and to learn how to drive and to embark on a 15,000 mile road trip to visit some of the strangers who'd written to me in response to my New York Times life interrupted column and to talk to them about their own experiences of living in the aftermath of a trauma like illness. And I embarked on that trip, not because I had some hankering to explore or uh, to see, you know, the wider expanses of the world, but because I had grown afraid of the world. Um, and that's the funny thing about being in treatment, especially when you've been in treatment for a long time. The hospital felt like a safe place to me. I understood that world. I knew how to speak fluent medicalese. It was the outside world that had come to feel daunting. And so I really wanted to push myself to figure out who I was on the other side of this experience. And of course, uh, we can't forget Oscar, right? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about Oscar. (laughs) Oscar uh, was the only time I've ever played the cancer card in my life. Uh, Shortly after my bone marrow transplant, I, um, like a lot of transplant patients was confined to my apartment um, because of the germ risk and felt really isolated. And so I just got it into my mind that I was going to adopt a dog. Uh, But given that I live in New York City, even rescuing a dog uh, is its own kind of competitive sport. So when I went to a local rescue organization and saw this adorable scruffy terrier mutt and learned that he already had about a dozen applications, I launched into this, you know, emotional soliloquy about how animals are the best medicine and that in this period of illness, I could really benefit from having a dog. And so that's how I got Oscar. And we really grew up together. He pushed me to start exercising, to start my day with walks. He pushed me to be more adventurous. And later when I went on the road trip, he was my co-pilot for the entire journey. Yeah, I mean, dogs really are important or or any animals that you feel connected to. I mean, I know that when I've gone through hard times, just having my dog, I have three dogs. So like, um, (laughs) and two of the dogs came to me from my sister who was moving and no longer could take care of the dogs. And it was me and my, my children. And we were going through a really tough time and they showed up right on time. It was Mm -hmm. like, we really needed them. And they were there. I mean, they really do heal. And, um, and I'm so happy that you've had that companionship Um, during your, your trip too. I'm sure it was invaluable. Yeah. I mean, I think the experience of having to care for another creature when you've been the recipient of so much care is healing in and in and of itself. Um, having to step outside of your own worries, of your own limitations, and to focus on a furry little being um, was a huge part of my healing. And it's no exaggeration to say that it was life-saving. 
Yeah. And, and probably a good icebreaker too, when you're meeting all these people. <laughs> Absolutely. Them, yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves, I mean, most people love dogs. <laughs> so, um, so how, so how many different places did you go to? Did, was it pretty much the United States and yeah. So I traveled to over, um, I think 35 states and I visited wow. about 22 different strangers, many of whom had had cancer or were living with cancer, but some of whom had had their life interrupted by different forms of loss and heartbreak. I visited a family of survivalist ranchers in Montana. I visited a prisoner on death row in Texas. Um, I visited a mother in Ojai, California, who lost her son. And those conversations became my breadcrumb trail through the wilderness of survival. And I called them my road guardians, but that's really what it felt like. Um, they were helping me see a way forward because the reality is, and, and what I learned the hard way is that you can't move on from an experience like cancer. I've come to think of moving on as a myth. We don't get to show the painful parts of our past. Um, and instead we have to learn to move forward with them. And so that process of not only going on the road, but really engaging with what I was struggling with and finding a sense of community within that uh, proved to be the best possible medicine I could have given to myself in addition to the dog. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was really struck by you talking about feeling like you had to be in a perfect state of wellness, mm -hmm. like, and, and it be so binary, like whole versus broken. And, you know, all these things like um, everybody goes through trauma and heartbreak, as you mentioned, and, and, um, and finding that in-between place. I really mm -hmm. loved that. Um, mm -hmm. that your TED talk, and I'm sure everybody was probably have the same reaction as me, but because it really resonates with, with all of us, mm -hmm. right? We all, you know, what have, what have your parents always told you? I would just want you to be happy, but yeah. you can't be happy all the time. Like you can't live in this perfect state of happiness and everything's going to be, you know, all of us go through something that just knocks us down. Absolutely. And for most of us, you know, we experience complicated joy and we have to learn how to hold two seemingly opposing things in the same palm. We have to hold loss with joy. We have to hold pain with healing. And I believe that health is more of a spectrum than a binary and that most of us exist somewhere in the messy middle. And so relieving that pressure of striving for some perfect state of wellness or happiness um, is actually counterintuitively uh, the way to feeling truly well, which is to say alive, uh, which is to say alive in the richest, messiest sense of the word. Um, and that's something that I practice every day, that I have to learn every day, that I have to make space for every day, that for most of us, our life isn't one thing or the other, or our mood isn't one thing or the other. It's figuring out how to carry it all. Yeah. And that, you know, we're all human and we all, it's life is messy. And, and it kind of reminds me of Jim Valvano's, um, you have to laugh, you have to think, you have to cry all in the same day, you mm -hmm. know, and, and just the ups and downs of, of the day, even one day. I mean, you have ups and downs. And being able to flow through that without, you know, the crying getting you so far down, you know, metaphorically, yeah. that you're not laughing. So Absolutely. Important. And so this trip and, and all of your, the people that you met with and, and spoke to, was there a, a, a common theme in all the stories you were hearing? So I think the biggest common theme was that sense that our health is porous um, and that we exist in the in-between space. I think when I initially set out on that journey, I hoped to arrive at a place where I felt healed, where this experience was behind me. Um, instead, I came to understand that 
healing is something we continuously do and that there isn't a kind of linear experience where one arrives at an end point. I think the other theme that came up again and again is what happens when we dare to be vulnerable, when we dare to share our most raw selves with the world. And at each turn uh, on my road trip, I found that there was a way in which vulnerability begets more vulnerability, begets more vulnerability. And so I had some of the most profound experiences of my life, I think, because I wasn't in a place where I had tough skin. I had the very opposite of tough skin. I had tender, porous skin. Um, and that allowed me to connect with these different people on a much more profound level. Um, I think it's also pushed me to tell stories differently. Uh, I'm most interested in writing about the in-between places, uh, about the people and stories that elude easy categorization. And I think when we dare to lead vulnerably, we learn again and again that we're more alike than we are different. Absolutely. And, and, and so is that what kind of Between Two Kingdoms means? So Between Two Kingdoms is a reference uh, to a line from Susan Sontag about how we all have dual citizenship in the kingdom of the sick and in the kingdom of the well, and that it's only a matter of time until we use that other passport. And so as much as I hoped to, you know, catapult myself back into the kingdom of the well, um, instead I found myself in between and rather than seeing that as a failure of recovery, I've to think of it as actually a far more accurate representation of how many of us live. Um, most of us are in that wilderness. And especially as we live longer and longer, many of us end up having our own life interrupted experiences, be it an illness or some other kind of heartbreak that brings you to the floor. And rather than trying to gloss over that, there's great richness to be excavated uh, in those moments of interruption. And that's not to cast, you know, a silver lining over a traumatic experience. Uh, but I do think in those moments when we're brought to the floor, we have an invitation to reroute our gaze to what really matters and to rethink what we're doing and why and how we want to live. It's beautiful. So let's let's kind of shift gears about um, about where you're going to be for the V Foundation. So why have you signed up to support the V Foundation through the Wine Celebration event? Mm. So the V Foundation's mission strikes very close to home. Uh, a year and a half ago, after almost 10 years of being cancer-free, I learned that my leukemia had returned and I underwent a second bone marrow transplant about a year ago. And unlike the first time, uh, this time around, I find myself in a more heightened in-between place. I will be in treatment for the rest of my life. And so funding cancer research is something that I feel passionately about, something that I've benefited from um, in the 10 years since I was first diagnosed, a new chemotherapy drug became available that got me into remission almost right away um, and contrast that with my first experience where it took me almost a year to get into remission. And so I've lived the benefits of what happens when we invest in cancer research. And, you know, given the uncertainty of what lies ahead for me, I also feel really passionately about furthering that research, not just for me, but for the many other patients in the United States who find themselves in similar situations. That's awesome that, that it's working for you. And, and it's, I've seen so many stories where 
yeah, the research is so important because, I mean, for when, like, when Jim Galvano is, was diagnosed to now, it's such a world of difference. Um, so many people are, are benefiting from cancer research. So, so glad that you're one of them. So why are you excited to participate in the actual event? Like, what, what do you hope people will get out of your talk? Mm, I'm really hoping to give people uh, a firsthand account of what it means to be a patient and what's at stake when you're sick. I also think we're going to have a lot of fun. I am a big wine lover. And so it's marrying my two passions, wine and cancer research. Um, and I'm just hoping that we get to have a beautiful afternoon of storytelling and inspiration and motivation to keep doing the good work. Have you been in Napa Valley before? Have you? So on my 30th birthday, uh, I actually ran the Napa to Sonoma half marathon, which was something that I dreamed of doing when I was in my hospital room during my first bout with leukemia. And I'm not a runner, and yet I did it. So uh, that was also as, you know, part of um, a cancer research fundraising effort. So it feels appropriate to be coming back for the V Foundation and like a full circle moment. Absolutely. And that's not a bad place to run a race. That's for sure. <laughs> a little too hilly for my taste. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a once in a lifetime experience and I'm, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> So what advice would you give to other people going through a cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment right mm -hmm. now? You know, there's so much focus on your physical well-being when you're going through cancer treatment on, you know, making sure you're getting the right treatment and taking your medications on time. But I think it's equally important to focus on mental health. Cancer treatment is something that affects the whole self, not just your body. And if I could go back in time, I wish I could have told that to my 22-year-old self. And we live in a country where we're fortunate to have access to so many different forms of support. There are support groups for cancer patients of all ages. Um, there are support groups for caregivers there are grants that pay for therapy. And so I think, you know, extending our focus to thinking of well-being in a more holistic way is crucial. Because like I said at the beginning of our conversation, what's the point of going through this if it's not to live a good life, a fulfilled life on the other side of treatment? The other thing I'd say, and it might sound like a cliche, but I think it's a true one, is that it really does take a whole village uh, to get through an experience like this. And so really focusing on nurturing a sense of community is something that's been invaluable to me. And that community is my family, it's my chosen family and friends, but it's also my nurses and doctors and social workers. And so taking the time to nurture that relation, those relationships um, has felt really invaluable throughout this whole experience. And some of the same nurses who cared for me during my first bone marrow transplant cared for me the second time around. And they really have come to feel like family to me and continue to shepherd me through this whole process. Yeah. And, and, and just, I'm sure you feel so isolated when you're going through that and, and just knowing that you're not alone and, and reaching out is so important. I feel like you definitely did that with your writing at least. And, you know, hopefully others can find the way that connects with them, however they want to reach out, but it's so important um, to do that. So I'm so glad that you did. And I think so many people have been touched by your writing and, and, um, and really, you know, I think you make people really identify with what you're going through and, and always of life. So I really appreciate that about you. What are the the beautiful things that you see about life now? Like what are um, mm. that you see happening in your life? Mm. You know, so 
given that this is my second time in treatment, I have the benefit of having gone through this before, which might sound like a strange way of putting it, but I have learned not to try to hold on to who I was pre-diagnosis or pre-relapse because I think that's an impossibility. Something like a cancer diagnosis changes who you are even on a molecular level. Um, And while that can feel terrifying and disorienting, um, there's also a lot of room for discovery. So I'll give you an example. When I was in the bone marrow transplant last February, I was on a medication that caused my vision to blur and double. And so I wasn't able to reach for the thing that sees me through, which is writing and a pen. And instead, I, you know, rather than feeling frustrated by that, I decided to try something I'd never done before, which was uh, painting with watercolors. And I've uncovered a whole new passion for painting that's um, feeding into my work in a really unexpected way. Uh, But I love watercolors because they're messy and you can't control them just like in life. And so, yeah, opening myself up to the newness that comes with illness has been a really important part of getting through um, and not just newness in terms of pastimes, but friendships as well. Um, Getting to know other patients has been one of the most beautiful parts of this experience. Prioritizing time with with my family in a way that I wouldn't necessarily have allowed myself has brought us closer together than ever before. And there's a lot to be learned about yourself when you're sick. Um, For much of this year, I've only had a couple of hours of energy each day um, to do the things that I care for. And what that's meant is that I've had to get really clear on what I want to do in those couple of hours and who I want to spend it with. And so in a funny way, uh, these limitations have really been clarifying and eye-opening. And I feel more clearly um, and firmly on the right path than I did before. That's, yeah, I I can definitely see that. Um, Wow. So I know that you have a newsletter and that you've written, um, I think you call isolation journals. That's right. Um, So is that how people can, I guess, follow you and, and, and really, um, be in touch with your journey and, and continue to learn. Absolutely. So I started this newsletter called the Isolation Journals in the early days of the pandemic because I wanted to share um, the practice that's helped me the most, which is journaling with a wider community. So every Sunday I write um, a letter to our community, which has grown to over 130,000 people from wow. all over the world. Uh, and we also include an essay and a journaling prompt from a guest contributor. And we've had all kinds of amazing contributors. We've had Grammy award-winning musicians and actors and writers and Olympians. Um, And we've also had a lot of unsung heroes. One of my very, very favorite essays and journaling prompts is from a six-year-old two-time cancer survivor, Lou Sullivan. So it's really a beautiful community space uh, where I hope people find inspiration, but also where people can connect and share their own stories with each other. Very cool. And your your book, um, Between Two Kingdoms, is available, I assume, um, on Amazon, at least. Any any other place that you <laughs> tell people? Um, yeah, your local bookstore. I'm always a fan of yeah. local bookstores. Love it. Love if you it. have one in your neighborhood, you can probably get a copy there. Um, and if you're not familiar with your local bookstore, it's a good opportunity to get to know them. Yes, yes. Uh, Okay, one more thing for you. And we ask everybody this at the end of our podcast. Victory over cancer is kind of our our tagline and it means different things to different people. Mm. So I wanted to ask, what does victory over cancer mean to you? Mm. 
My answer now is probably very different to what it would have been before my relapse. So I no longer think of victory over cancer as necessarily being cured forever because I know that that likely won't happen for me. But what it means to me now is finding access to treatments that don't just allow me to survive, but to live. And that distinction feels really important to me right now. Um, And so as wonderful and, and grateful as I am to be surviving, I'm also really focused on finding the treatments and the support Uh, that allows me to live as fully and richly and messily as I can. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. 